A People's History of Kansas City is brought to you with the support of the Midwest Genealogy Center, which provides access to more than 20 online family history research resources, including Ancestry.com and Find My Past. Learn more at mymcpl.org slash genealogy. This is A People's History of Kansas City, a podcast from KCUR 89.3. I'm Suzanne Hogan. He was just kind of a cowboy who did things his way. I wanted him to know what the law was and tell them that they need to obey the law. And sure enough, the trunk popped open and out comes this guy in a suit and a hat. When my friend and colleague Matthew Long Middleton first talked to me about doing a story about a hot-headed Kansas cop, I had my doubts. But when I learned that this guy's crazy antics are actually the reason I can drink a cocktail in Kansas today, my attitude changed. Kansas has historically been a weird place when it comes to alcohol. It's a state that had a strong temperance history, with folks like Carrie Nation, a Kansas woman who was known for attacking drinking establishments with a hatchet in the early 1900s. Kansas' drinking laws over the years have been contradictory and unclear. For a long time, you couldn't buy liquor by the drink in Kansas unless you belonged to a dining club. My parents also remember the 60s, the days when 18-year-olds would drive to Kansas to get booze because you had to be 21 in Missouri. But the beer in Kansas was 3.2 beer up until just recently. When it comes to booze in Kansas, it's been a state that's been slow to change. But the person who helped change the laws was actually the person who enforced the drinking laws the most. And he was a guy that used some pretty unconventional and questionable tactics. Matthew Long Middleton is a producer at KCUR 89.3, and he brings us this story. So when I first heard some of these stories, honestly, they sounded like folk legends. Some of them, I was like, come on. I was having dinner with my colleague, Jim McLean. He's been a reporter in Kansas for, uh, well, a while. And you might recognize him from another KCUR podcast, My Fellow Kansans. He's telling me old stories about Kansas, and he starts talking about this guy. He wasn't very big, but he was in good shape, and he he pretty much looked like he was ready to pounce at any time. He would charge into dangerous situations and handle them himself and got into gunfights and all kinds of physical altercations. There were more stories of shootouts on buses, drug busts, fistfights, death threats. But this wasn't the Wild West days of Kansas. It was the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. And this guy, Vern Miller, wasn't the criminal He was the lawman. Eventually, he would become the attorney general of Kansas and even ran for governor. He was just kind of a cowboy who did things his way. The narrative of the state of Kansas, where you had these marshals and these sheriffs of these Wild West communities that would take matters in hand and clean up the town, right? Well, there was a certain amount of that to Vern Miller. His signature move during busts throughout his career was he'd pop out of trunks. He'd hide in the trunk of a car, and when the signal was given, he'd pop out like a haunted house prop and arrest people. As I started digging around about Vern Miller, I quickly realized he was a polarizing guy. I think Vern Miller stands today as one of the greatest public figures in Kansas history. He was like a legal pit bull. He was the most active attorney general we've ever had. And the press followed him. He was news. And he was news that some people hated. When I asked about him on some Facebook groups, a guy named Mike Blau wrote, he was the worst of the worthless. He wrote that in all caps, by the way. Tim Murphy, he was terrible. Didn't that nut try to arrest plane passengers for drinking over Kansas or keep planes from serving alcohol over Kansas or some nutty crap like that? Chris Craig, Byrne truly was a P.O.S. in many ways. Byrne lived the rag-to-riches American dream. He was from the poorest part of Wichita there was, Hoover's Orchard. It was notorious because of uh, what we could see from the outside was uh, what appeared to be cardboard shacks. Mike Danford grew up in Wichita and wrote a biography about Vern Miller. As a child, Vern lived on 10 acres. His dad worked in downtown Wichita, They had a few cows, and Vern also worked at a nearby dairy in the pre-dawn hours. He was a literal cowboy, and he would ride his pet donkey standing on its back. When I started this research online, people speculated that Vern was dead, but he's not. 
He's 91 years old now, and I tracked him down through Mike Danford and Vern's children. He now lives outside of Phoenix, so I called him up. Hi, Vern, can you hear me? Oh, is it hear you well, huh? Vern's memory is still spot on, and he could tell me about his early years, how he became one of the toughest guys in town. There was a lot of scrapping going on. Everybody scrapped at that age and back in those days. Yeah, you know, boxing without gloves sometimes. He joined the Army when conflict broke out in Korea in the 1950s. And when he was discharged, he returned to Wichita, jobless. A cryptic ad in the paper caught his eye because he knew he met one of the qualifications, ability to drive a motorcycle. So he basically showed up and learned there that the job was as a road patrolman with the sheriff's office. Vern showed he could drive a motorcycle and started work that same day. And it turns out Vern really liked being in law enforcement. He was passionate about his work, but he also brought his scrapping spirit to his work. As a traffic cop, there's a story of Vern after a high-speed chase, whipping the man in the face and pulling the suspect through the car window. Remember, this was a time before body cameras and cell phone videos when police tactics were not always questioned. And Vern didn't shy away from violence. One night, Vern got into a fistfight with his boss, the sheriff, in his boss's own home. Yeah, so Vern lost his job in the Sedgwick County Sheriff's Office after that. But several years later, in 1964... Vern ran for sheriff in Sedgwick County and won. At the time, Sedgwick was Kansas's most populous county. It included the city of Wichita. As sheriff, he was going all over the county, busting people for infractions big and small. He busted gambling rings of all kinds, even telling churches they had to suspend their cash bingo games. A lot of old ladies in Dan didn't like that. You know, they like to play bingo. People would claim that Vern even raided churches, but he denies that ever happening. He especially enforced Kansas's unique drinking laws, which at the time prohibited people from purchasing liquor by the drink. And he says what always motivated him was a commitment to the law. Kansas so long hadn't had any laws enforced along those areas. I wanted them to know what the law was and tell them that they needed to obey the law. If they didn't, then uh, there'd be trouble about it. Vern's friends and family also say the same. In fact, it may be what sets him apart from your run-of-the-mill moralizer, according to his friend and former campaign advisor, John Frieden. Of all the years I have known him, I don't think I've ever had a discussion with him on the evils of cocktails or drinking. But I've had plenty of discussions with him on does this violate the law? And if it does, we have to enforce it. And it wasn't like Vern was against drinking personally. He would drink socially. Vern didn't just philosophize about law. The quality that defined him was his courage in enforcing it. It was his greatest strength and weakness. Like back in the summer of 1968 in Missouri, an old farmer was handcuffed to a chair in his home, shot three times in the head, and robbed. The two suspects fled in the victim's car, abandoning it at a bus stop in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Local authorities there began calling stops along the various routes, asking sheriffs if they'd stop buses. One bus was going through Wichita in Sedgwick County, where Vern was sheriff. He jumped at the opportunity. He knew nothing about the suspects. He didn't know their names or even what they looked like, but he pulled over a Continental Trailways bus at 12.26 a.m. And according to Vern's son, Marty Miller. He and another guy get on the bus, a detective, and uh, they have their white shirts on. To not give away that they were cops, Vern led his partner down the narrow aisle, just looking for someone suspicious. He spots one man towards the back of the bus and says, Son, let me see your ID. Well, that's when the guy pulled up a pistol. And so my dad jumped on the guy and uh, started wrestling with the pistol. And uh, the detective that was next to him. Vern's partner had shot the man right in the chest. But then. And the other guy uh, sitting across the seat with a gal, they had a rifle, but they couldn't get it up because the seats were so close. So then the fight ended up over there and they got them subdued. The man who initially pulled his gun died. And the other suspect went to prison for that murder in Missouri. 
The crowded bus gunfight made headlines. And while some Kansans admired his courage and brass style, others considered it reckless arrogance. It was just this spirit that almost started a mini-state civil war in Kansas in 1967. And it happened like this. Vern was giving public testimony on some other issue entirely. But during it, he essentially called Leavenworth County lawless. Leavenworth, by the way, is over 190 miles away from Sedgwick County. The lead prosecutor in Leavenworth didn't like being publicly shamed. And a few days later, while Vern is directing traffic in Wichita, a Leavenworth County cop shows up. And I says, uh, what are you doing? He says, Vern, I got a spin for you. And I says, what for? And he says, for an inquisition. And he's going to say you were lying and you're going to get charged with perjury. And I says, you got to be kidding me. And he says, no. He says, you better get your lawyer and come up there because this guy is mean. So Vern gets a friend of his, a former FBI agent and lawyer, Ernie, to come up with him to be his counsel during his sworn testimony. They get to the Leavenworth courthouse, and the attorney invites them into his office. But Vern isn't going to step into the trap. He says he's not going in without his lawyer, Ernie. They have this big back and forth. Finally, the Leavenworth prosecutor says, Then you're both under arrest. So he says to the two officers, arrest him and put him in jail. By then, things got a little hot, and I was a little hot, and I said, first one of you guys gets out of the chair, I'm going to kill. Don't make a mistake. Apparently, nobody wanted to kill or be killed. So Vern and his lawyer, Ernie, storm out of the courthouse. Ernie says they have to go to the attorney general and tell him what's going down. They drive to Topeka to tell the AG, and at the end of that meeting, Ernie and Vern are so incensed, they tell the AG... We'll come back and serve the subpoena, but when we do, it will be with 30 armed Sedgwick County deputies. The attorney general said, oh, no, we can't have a big fight like that going on in Kansas. So Vern and Ernie drive back down to Wichita, and when they get off the turnpike, they're handed a message. And it says, do not return to Leavenworth. Case dismissed. The attorney general had pulled some strings to defuse the situation between the two counties. No, I felt bad, but let me, let me tell you. I'm in a bind. At that time in Kansas, it was not against the law to resist an unlawful arrest. He's right. In fact, because of these events, the Kansas legislature passed a law making it illegal to resist an unlawful arrest. It became known as Miller's Law, named after Vern Miller. Right or wrong, these two incidents and others got Vern attention outside of Wichita and Sedgwick County. And while Vern certainly had his detractors, he was popular as a lawman. Remember, the 60s were a turbulent time in the U.S. We were in the midst of a protracted conflict in Vietnam. At home, there was a bitter struggle for racial equality. And counterculture hippies were rejecting social conventions. And amid all of this, Vern Miller was dependable, maybe to a fault, in what seemed like an upended and undependable world. He was also dependable to turn out Democratic votes in populous Sedgwick County. Or at least that's what Democratic Governor Bob Docking was counting on when he came to Vern in 1969, asking him to run for attorney general. Vern was reluctant. No Democrat in Kansas had held the attorney general's office in 80 years. The governor and Vern agreed it was unlikely Vern would win. Plus, Vern had been planning to go into private practice after leaving the sheriff's office. He had earned his law degree by commuting, sometimes by a friend's private plane, to and from Oklahoma. And I told him, I said, you know, I don't know nothing about being an attorney general. But eventually... Uh, they took me into running. And he and Bob Docking went on to win. Suddenly, this tenacious, pugnacious sheriff was the top cop in Kansas. He brought his mobile home up from Wichita to his new base in Topeka. And with it, he brought every part of himself to the job. Democratic campaigner John Frieden remembers Vern telling his staff what he expected of them. You never forget that you represent the people of the state of Kansas. And when you're writing your opinions and when you're making your decisions, you make them based upon what the law is and you do it honestly and let the chips fall where they may. 
Traditionally, the job of attorney general is treated as a management job. You make sure the laws of the state are enforced through memos and decisions about where to deploy investigative and prosecutorial resources across the state. But according to John Frieden, Byrne saw it slightly differently. The attorney general is the chief law enforcement officer, and he was hands-on. Boy, was he. During his campaign for AG, he pledged to, quote, land in the middle of the drug-ridden hippie commune at Lawrence with both feet. Within the first weeks of being on the job, he not only directed but also personally executed raids in Lawrence and at the University of Kansas. Susan Hudgens, who now lives outside of Topeka, says she witnessed one of those raids when she was a high schooler who had cruised into Lawrence with her friends. They found themselves hanging out near one of the dorms. We were enjoying one of those crisp, crunchy, wonderful fall evenings. We were basically hanging out there talking and counting money amongst us to see if we could go to the pool hall or somewhere else. Then a number of cars pulled up. And sure enough, the trunk popped open, and out comes this guy in a suit and a hat. It was Vern Miller. He and his men converged on the buildings. And as they start going in, lights start going on. You know, these are high-rise buildings. And lights start going on from the bottom to the top. And we can see stuff flying out the window. With all the cops inside, Susan and her friends saw an opportunity. We just uh, grabbed a trash bag and went over to the bushes around the dorms and started looking for what we could find. It was like Halloween and the Easter Bunny, quite a bunch of uh, marijuana and Ziploc bags and various paraphernalia items, mostly small things. We picked it up and made off with it before anybody noticed. I didn't ask what happened next, but I'll leave that to your imagination. These raids left a mark on some people. It was weird. It was kind of a you never knew where he might pop up. And it was more of an urban legend for us. Watch out. It could be Vern in that trunk. He acted more like the FBI guys chasing Bonnie and Clyde than a bureaucrat passing papers and writing reports. And that impression stuck. And it was this kind of brash public enforcement that upset then Kansas Speaker of the House Calvin Strollrig. The day after the KU raid, Calvin marches into the AG's office as Vern's son Marty remembers this story. Never sits down, starts putting his finger in my dad's nose, starts threatening him about the next time he does a raid, he has to tell the legislature And he wanted to know where the money came from to do such a thing, in which it didn't cost the state one dime. And my dad goes, you know, buddy, I don't know who you are, but I'm going to kick your you-know-what. Chased the guy out of his office and chased him down the hallway. And so when they got to the stairs, the dad turned around and went back to his office. And uh, it wasn't before long the governor called dad. He says, "Uh, do you know who you just chased out of your office? And Dad says, no, I don't even know who the guy was. He was being very rude and threatening me, and I'm not going to take that. I heard from two other sources that Vern actually punched the Speaker of the House. When I asked Vern about punching an elected official, he says, No, no, I don't remember anything like that. We never had any physical confrontation. Vern remained dogged, continuing his very public and active enforcement. As he saw it and wrote to all the district attorneys of Kansas, nothing breeds disrespect for the law like a double standard. Which brings us to the story that probably brought Vern and the whole state of Kansas the most notoriety of all. Greyhound and Trailways bus lines called Vern's office, inquiring if they could serve liquor on their buses through Kansas. In the early 1970s in Kansas, it was illegal to sell liquor by the drink unless you belonged to a private club which required you to pay a club membership fee to a restaurant. That was the law. And Vern told them, with these requirements, I don't see how you could do it. And they replied, well, Amtrak is doing it. Vern had found a double standard. He called a meeting and his colleagues goaded him. What about Amtrak? Is that too big for you? And I said, no, I don't think so. So I wrote the people in charge of Amtrak. Vern's son, Marty, says... The lawyers in York says, you can't touch us. We're a federal entity. Dad sits down with the, with the lawyers in the attorney general's office, and they go, well, Vern, I, I don't know what we're going to do, you know. And what Dad says, I know what we're going to do. We're going to put some agents on the train in Kansas City. 
when they get off at Newton, if they've uh, been drinking, we're going we're gonna to raid the train. I put two KBI officers on the train in Kansas City, Missouri. It's after 10 p.m. in Newton, Kansas. The stop is supposed to take just a minute, but Vern is waiting. As the train is letting passengers off and on, his officers board and begin taking all the liquor. So while we're carrying a whiskey off, the conductor comes back, and he's really mad, and he fuming, and he says, get off this train right now. He says, what are you doing? And I said, we're taking your whiskey. And he said, I said, get off this train right now. And uh, I said, nah, it's not going to happen, fella. And he said, it is. If I have to throw you off. So I said, well, you better get started doing that because I've got these officers here to help me. So they latched on to him. And I said, put him in jail. They put him in jail. And the train couldn't leave without a conductor. So the train set all night there in Newton, Kansas, a little podunk town. It would take a day for a new conductor to fly down from Chicago. And meanwhile, Amtrak lawyers file an injunction, which gets promptly thrown out of U.S. District Court. Amtrak appeals this ruling to the Supreme Court. But it's kind of clear in the Constitution. The states regulate alcohol delivered to or used in their state. So Fern won. And the consequences of this ruling didn't stop there. After our first raid there, I got a call from the lawyers in the airlines. And they said, yeah, General, what are you going to do about the airplanes? And I said, well, fellas, I believe you're under the same law. And I believe you're subject to it. So if you stop, I won't be raiding a plane. So they said, well, it stopped. So they stopped serving liquor over Kansas for a couple of years. Well, all this shone an uncomfortable spotlight on Kansas. There were late night talk show jokes about it. And people to this day still circulate the untrue legend that Vern and his KBI agents also raided planes. It would take over a decade, but eventually the people of Kansas amended their own constitution to allow liquor sales by the drink. Vern's son, Marty, feels confident that if anybody's thankful for liquor by the drink, they need to thank my dad. That may or may not have been what Vern had in mind, but many people's lives were affected by his strict enforcement of Kansas law, whether it was a delayed journey on Amtrak or years in prison for marijuana possession. Vern ran for re-election as attorney general in 1972 and won every single county in Kansas. And two years later, when Governor Bob Docking decided to run for U.S. Senate, the Democratic Party was looking for someone to continue their hold on the governor's office and called on Vern. And as John Frieden remembers... The pressure was just enormous. I mean, there wasn't a day that there weren't people in his office saying, you got to run for governor. You know you can win. There was a poll run right before he ran for governor. In that particular poll, he had 85% of the support of the people of Kansas. I have never seen a poll that favorable to a candidate. But at the same time... I never heard Vern say, I really want to be governor. Uh, He may have thought that, but I never heard him say that. The race would be close, really close. Vern lost to Robert Bennett by less than half a percentage point, just 3,677 votes. A number of those lost votes were in Douglas County, where the University of Kansas is. Years of making a public example out of the drug-ridden hippie commune had maybe been too much. Vern's campaigner, John Frieden, And I think anybody that looks back at that, those times, the laws that he enforced that the people kind of were uncomfortable with, they changed the laws. And we came back into the 20th century. Vern spent the rest of his working days practicing law in Wichita and eventually retired to Phoenix. He's been honored by the Kansas Bar Association, but his story is really complicated. His approach to law enforcement would get more scrutiny today as police brutality and hardline approaches to law enforcement have become major issues. 
Vern was courageous and tough as nails. He was ready to escalate a situation of force at the drop of a dime. And in the end, many of his efforts were over infractions that ultimately would become legal. His story is an unconventional one, to say the least. But there's no denying that this fanatical, renegade lawman made Kansas what it is today. KCUR's Matthew Long Middleton. A People's History of Kansas City is a production from KCUR 89.3, made possible with the support of the Midwest Genealogy Center, which can help you learn more about the history of Kansas City through a searchable version of the Kansas City Star dating back to 1880. Learn more at mymcpl.org slash genealogy. We would love to hear from you. Do you know of an unforgettable character from Kansas City history that we should do an episode about? Give us a call and leave us a message. 816-235-8930. That's 816-235-8930. Or you can send us an email, peopleshistorykc at kcur.org. I've been loving all the ideas and stories that you all have been sending so far, so keep them coming. I do read them. And I'm coming up with a crazy, amazing long list for possible stories to cover in the future. If you haven't gone back and listened to our shows about Wyandotte badass lawyer Lida Conley or the Black History of Lincoln College Preparatory Academy, I suggest you do so. And if you like what you hear on these episodes, feel free to share them with your friends. Or better yet, write us a review. Our team is made up of Sylvia Maria Gross, Mike Russo, Ann Knigendorf, and Salisa Kalakal. We had help from CJ Janovey, Cody Newell, Krista Henthorne, Andrea Tudhope, and Tracy Bauer. Our theme music is by Primary Color, and we also had tracks this episode from Blue Dot Sessions and Scott Buckley. I'm Suzanne Hogan. Take care, and thanks for listening. <laughs>